The Game Designer's Playbook, Chapter 1, Introduction The thing with humans is, even when our basic needs are met, we choose to do something instead of nothing. Both individually and collectively, our curiosity constantly nags at us to do something. Maybe it is this constant desire for something that has resulted in the rich library of recreational activities humans have come to enjoy. We watch movies, listen to music, travel, read, write, and of course, play games. The question of why humans invented games, or first came to enjoy them, is a fascinating one, but it's not our primary focus. Instead, here we examine the question of what makes games fun today, and how different design choices can make a game more or less enjoyable. What's in a game? So ingrained in our culture is the notion of games and play that most people have an intuitive sense of what makes up a game. Games are often defined as a structured form of play comprising rules, which dictate the actions available to players and how they are performed, boundaries, which delineate the game space from the real world, and outcomes, which result from playing the game. Let's look at table tennis as an example. As an oversimplification, the rules of the game specify that players can hit the ball with their paddle, and a player scores if their opponent fails to return a volley before the ball hits the ground. Spatial boundaries define the game as occurring within the vicinity of the table, and the outcome of a match is such that the player with the most points is declared the victor. Attempting to define games with this level of rigor leads to some matters of debate in terms of what should be labeled as a game. While there is certainly a place for this sort of debate, here we assume a more informal definition of the term. For our purposes, we can loosely define a game as any interactive experience where participation is a goal in itself. There are two key points in this understanding of what defines a game interactivity and engagement. Interactivity distinguishes games from other non-interactive entertainment media, such as books, movies, or television. Games are inherently participatory experiences, as players' actions might affect the course of a game in some way. In turn, the resulting changes affect which actions are available to players and their strategy in performing those actions. In terms of engagement, Though the completion of a game often promises some reward, players do not play solely for the privilege of viewing an ending screen. Instead, the goal of engaging with a game is experiencing all it has to offer. This creates a particular delineation between games and productivity software. Obviously, this understanding of games is quite broad. Moving forward, this understanding is sufficient for comprehending and applying the design principles discussed. Interaction lies at the core of every game. Games provide players with opportunities for interaction. They give players something to do. Likewise, interaction shapes the course of a game. Such changes might be as straightforward as incrementing a player's score, or as complex as requiring characters to adapt to the death of a simulated companion. The nature of player interaction can vary wildly depending on the game in question. In board games, player interaction has a physical component, but is in many cases symbolic of some imagined scenario. Digital games offer a greater level of abstraction between the physical actions taken by players and their meaning in the context of a game. With a game's world having few or no tethers to the physical reality of the player, the possibility space of interaction designed for digital games is enormous. Naturally, the spectrum of interactions from the literal to the abstract is far from absolute. Games played in the physical world often have in-game consequences divorced from reality. Some digital games design their interactions to have varying degrees of analogy between players' physical movements and in-game actions. This is why games are often described as occurring within the magic circle. The game space is separate from reality. The very same action occurring inside the magic circle has a very different meaning when performed outside the magic circle. 
Over the course of a session, players may execute hundreds or thousands of individual actions shaping their experience. It is thus vital that these actions are satisfying and enjoyable to sustain player engagement. A sufficiently well-designed interaction can keep players coming back again and again after hundreds of hours of play. Conversely, a slight imperfection in the look or feel of an action might make players feel frustrated after a few hours. The task of creating these actions poses a number of challenging questions, such as how can we design interactions which contribute to player satisfaction and enjoyment while blending in with the greater game experience so as not to be intrusive. It is the job of an interaction designer to answer questions like this and deliver a satisfying experience. This requires an intimate understanding of player needs, preferences, and motivations, as well as foundational knowledge built from existing designs. A good starting point, therefore, is to assess how games and the way we play them has evolved throughout the course of history. A Brief History of Game Interaction As ancient civilizations bloomed thousands of years ago, people began making and playing games. These games ranged in strategic complexity and varied in their cultural or religious significance. Some of the earliest artifacts related to games are small tokens unearthed at burial sites in southern Turkey dating back to the 3rd millennium BCE. The tokens are thought to have functioned as game pieces, similar to other objects found throughout Mesopotamia from the same period. More substantial remnants exist for games played in Sumeria and Egypt around the same time. Despite the fact that many ancient rule sets are assumed to be lost forever, we can already see commonalities in design between these games and their modern counterparts. These commonalities are not to suggest that there exists some magic set of interactions, outside of which there is no room for innovation. Take the idea of a game board, for example. In its most basic form, a game board is a static surface used to track the location of tokens. But why should a board limit itself to a fixed configuration? Why should it serve as a backdrop rather than an active part of play? Modern game design explored answers to such questions, often subverting convention by putting a twist on classic mechanics and modes of play. The static game board is rethought in titles like Terraforming Mars, which lets players change the board's contents during play to simulate shifting the geography of an alien world. This game, along with dozens of others, present refreshing iterations on the notion of board-based game design. It is a fascinating lesson in the nature of human creativity that the precursors of such ideas can be traced back to antiquity with relative ease. Before the invention of computers, all game interaction was necessarily physical and mostly literal in nature. Games were still limited by the physical objects they were played with and the capability of their human operators. Rule complexity was restricted by what human players could be expected to memorize or reference while maintaining reasonable gameplay pace. Though there was still a great deal of variety, Simplicity can prove itself a virtue in terms of widespread appeal and longevity. Snakes and ladders can hardly be said to have much depth, and yet it is a mainstay of family board game collections, particularly due to its easy learnability for young children. At the other end of the spectrum, Dungeons & Dragons has spawned entire volumes dedicated to explaining lore and the rules of play. Computer games as we know them today date back to the 1950s, created largely as academic curiosities. Decades later, Pong, Atari's 1973 creation, kickstarted the arcade age and eventually brought about classics like Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, Frogger, and hundreds of others. At the time, this marked a massive leap in design and player understanding. Games no longer had to physically play out on tabletops, instead they could live in virtual space, creating a system comprising user, game, and machine. 
This new mode of gameplay necessarily introduced a layer of abstraction, requiring an input device for players to communicate their intended action. Interaction was now metaphorical in some way. Rather than physically moving tokens around, a button press would serve as a proxy for firing the weapon on a spaceship. These early devices needed to be simple and easy to learn above all else. With the popularization of home PCs still a decade away, most people had little or no prior experience operating a computer. Early arcade cabinets used dials, switches, and buttons to facilitate user input interaction paradigms, which were already established thanks to devices such as radios and television remotes. It would be a long journey from these early controls to the sophisticated gaming-specific peripherals that would emerge decades later. Both technological limitations and economic motivations shaped the experience design of arcade games. The limited computer power available imposed constraints on the complexity of game mechanics and graphics, and the scope of game content. Commercially, turnover needed to be incentivized. One player snagging a few hours of game time on a single quarter was hardly profitable. Both of these pressures favored shorter play sessions, where a relatively small amount of content could be packed in to boost excitement, and revenue could be maximized. Game experience design would evolve substantially over the next several years as the advent of home consoles and computers changed how video games were consumed. Instead of making small purchases to spend a short amount of time playing, game copies could be purchased outright. A larger scope, made possible with increased computing power, led to longer experiences that could be enjoyed over hours, days, or weeks. Home computers also made the craft of game development more accessible, leading to a flood of new industry talent and veritable explosion in design creativity. Looking back, many of these early efforts would have been criticized extensively by contemporary standards, technical limitations aside. The transition from coin-operated games to home titles marked a substantial shift in design thinking. Some aspects of the arcade mentality didn't translate well to at-home games, and some of the experiences created for home consoles were unlike anything attempted before. People craved more depth and diversity than mere high scores could provide. They wanted games to build fantastical worlds, tell stories, and let them play with friends. 21st century computing didn't just change the way games looked and felt, but redefined the role games play in our everyday lives. Smartphones and other mobile devices have rendered games ubiquitous, playable anywhere and anytime. Streaming has brought video games on par with traditional sports in terms of viewership, and virtual reality has finally established a footing as a platform in its own right. The meteoric rise of video games to arguably the most pervasive form of entertainment prompts a rather obvious question. Why? What makes games so contagious? Consider the many mental, physical, emotional, and social opportunities that a game experience has to offer. Perhaps it is a combination of all these factors that make games so compelling. Or perhaps our infatuation with games is simply a product of that human appetite for purpose, the desire to do something. How to use this book or video series. The Game Designer's Playbook will help you learn to think like an interaction designer, following a user-centric ethos. You'll learn how to critically analyze your own designs and those of others, and how to view those designs from the player's perspective. This book also provides a brief introduction to the study of human-computer interaction and how to apply general design standards to the task of crafting game interactions. Each chapter is written to function as its own, with no particular background from prior chapters necessary for understanding. However, if you are relatively new to game design, we suggest beginning with chapter 2 to establish some of the terms and ideas used throughout the rest of the book. 
Chapter 2 will also provide a detailed look at what sort of content you can expect from the sections that follow. This video series will cover each chapter of the book, but as it's intended as a companion piece, we highly recommend checking out the book itself for the full picture, along with practical exercises and interviews with experts working in the games industry. Scanning the QR code shown will take you to the store page. Regardless of where you begin your journey with the remainder of the book, remember that our goal is the same throughout, to create something memorable and magical for our players. Good luck and have fun!